to Road Church Online, we're so glad you joined us today. My name is Emily, and you have joined us on week four of our sermon series, The Big Picture. Pastor Darren will be sharing a message from God's Word a little later, but before we continue, I would love for you to share this video as it really does help spread what God is doing here at Broadway Church. And if you've not yet subscribed to our channel, we encourage you to do this now, and you'll always be in the loop with all the things going on here at Broadway. If you happened to miss last week's message, Pastor Darren spoke on act three of the big picture, summarizing the rest of the Old Testament. He shared about Israel's constant rebellion against God and yet how God was faithful to them and used certain people along the way. Check out this clip. Well, know this. As certain as you can hear my voice today, on the authority of God's word, I can promise you this. God is just as interested in your life as he was in the lives of Abram and Sarai. God has plans and purposes for your life and your future, just like he did for the lives of Abram and Sarai. All that's missing, all that's lacking to unleash God's provision in your life is your decision to trust his promise, to say yes to God's plans, to embrace God's purposes. If you want to hear the full message, you can go to our website where we have the entire sermon available for you. In just a few moments, the worship team is going to come and lead us in a time of worship. Before that happens, why don't you check out some of the announcements on what's coming up here at the church. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Megan and I'm the Vancouver Campus Kids Pastor here at Broadway. We have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? That means the next step in your faith is to get baptized in water. If you've never made the decision to be baptized, we would love to invite you to take that next step this Easter Sunday. On March 31st, we will be having a special baptism service at all of our campuses, and we would love for you to be a part of it. You can apply to get baptized by clicking the baptism tab on the website. If you are a youth or young adult ages 15 to 25, we would love for you to join us on our annual Yukon missions trip. On this missions trip, we lead a camp just outside of Whitehorse and it is truly a life-changing experience. In fact, Broadway Church has been sending teams there for over 40 years. The deadline to sign up is March 31st, so make sure to sign up soon. All of the information is on the website. Risen Worship, the worship team of our Chinese ministry, will be hosting a worship concert on March 16th from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the City Reach Warehouse. This is a great opportunity to worship together and a time to get to know other people. Please join us and bring a friend. This event is free, but you have to register through our website or on the Chinese ministry Facebook page. City Reach is currently seeking a full-time program coordinator for our Food for Families program. This person would be responsible to manage the Vancouver site and provide the necessary leadership to our team that works together to feed 3,000 people each week. If this interests you, please check out the job description on the website. If you have kids between zero to grade eight, we have a fun opportunity coming up during spring break. Join us on March 19th and 21st between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for spring break family fun at the Vancouver campus. On March 19th, we'll have a bouncy obstacle course. And on March 21st, we will have not one, but two shows from our friends at Science World. Register online today. If you missed anything that I said, you can visit our website, broadwaychurch.com for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now it's almost time for us to worship, but first I wanna read you a short passage to prepare our hearts for what God wants to do in this moment from 1 Peter 2.9. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Whether you realize it or not, you have been chosen by God. He has made you for a purpose, and part of that purpose is to worship Him and declare who He is. We have an opportunity to do that right now as we sing these songs and worship together. 
So let's make the most of this time and wherever you're at, whatever else you might be doing or thinking about in this moment, let's pause and lift God up for who he is and all he has done. Your heart will never 
continue to sing, continue to raise our voices, clap our hands, and praise the God who lives and the God who saves.
In the darkness we were waiting With our hope, with our light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Come on, if you know the lyrics, sing it out Sing praise the
we can come to him even when our worship is messy. And you might have come in here feeling broken, feeling like you don't have the right words to say, feeling like you're not in the right state of mind, but know that you can come to him however you are. You can come to him messy, you can come to him feeling shaken up. And so however you're feeling right now, let's just lift up our worship to him, lift up our praise. Give him praise for who he is and he welcomes us in. So let's sing this out. Here I stand, high in surrender. of Jesus Christ, amen? We, we're not just the church here in this room today, represented by one service at Broadway at our Vancouver campus. There is a congregation that met just before us and there's a congregation that we're gonna meet again tonight here in Vancouver. There's two congregations meeting at our Poco, our Poco campus and a congregation out in Surrey at Broadway Church meeting uh, right now as well. Now. All of our campuses here at Broadway, we're not just the only churches meeting, singing these songs together today. There are churches all across the lower mainland singing these very same songs, praising this very same God, exalting Him to His rightful place all across our nation right now. And so together, we, the Church of Jesus, join with all of these churches to make his name famous, to lift his name up high. Amen? Amen. And so it's not lost on me that all of this worship is for him. It's to him. It's because of him. We don't stand here and worship for us, for our sake, because it feels good for us. We do it for him. And it exalts him acknowledge his lordship in our life and in the universe. And so together, we humbly surrender our place and say, God, it's about you. It's always been about you and it will always be for you. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you close your eyes for just a moment as we end this time of singing our praise and worship? in a prayer. Jesus, today be honored. Today be lifted to your rightful place as King, 
on your throne of the universe. We acknowledge together as your church that all things are in your control and at, at your command, all things happen. So Jesus be worshiped, be glorified and be exalted in this place we pray. In your holy and precious name, everyone said together. Welcome to Broadway Church. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship today. If you're new to Broadway Church, we would love for you to fill out our digital in-touch card. Just scan the QR code on the screen and fill out the form. A pastor will get back to you and help you find answers to your questions about growing in your faith or connecting at Broadway. We are now going to transition into our time of giving. If you are new to Broadway Church, please feel under no obligation to give. You do not have to pay to watch or attend church. However, if you would like to financially support what God is doing here at Broadway, we would love for you to do that now. Our preferred way of giving is for you to go to the Give tab on our website and check out the online banking giving option. We can accept your credit card over the phone if you call the church office. You can come in person from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during the week if you want to drop off. You can also use text to give. If you text the word give to the number on the screen, it'll walk you through the prompts to get set up. Or you can mail checks to the church office. We also want to help you by providing some discussion questions based on today's topic immediately after the sermon. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Pastor Darren will be sharing a message with us in just a moment. But first, why don't you take a moment to subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with what's happening here at Broadway. And before we get into the message, we wanna show you a quick video highlighting our upcoming Easter bash in partnership with City Reach. Let's watch this video together. We are so excited to announce that our annual spring celebration, Easter Bash, in partnership with City Reach and Broadway Church, is here once again. Join us on Saturday, March 30th from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. in Vancouver or Port Coquitlam. This event is free and is designed for families with kids under 12. We will have 35,000 chocolate eggs, bouncy castle, a special Easter presentation, and so much more. So make sure to invite your friends and join us in celebrating Easter. We are also on the hunt for volunteers to help make this event a big success. So please sign up if you would like to help. For more information or to sign up to volunteer, please visit cityreach.org slash Easter Bash. When we're standing on a mountaintop, things become a little clearer. It can help us get a better sense of the lay of the land. We can see how the roads intersect, where the sea meets the land, and how everything connects. In this series, we want to view the entire story of the Bible from a mountaintop perspective. We don't want to just focus on one part of the narrative. We want to see it all. It's all about getting the whole scope of the Bible, the way it all connects. It's about finding the thread that weaves these stories together. It's about getting what we'd like to call the big picture. Have you ever read something that Jesus said and wondered why he would say such a thing? For example, after watching Jesus perform a bunch of miracles, his followers finally inform him that they have finally come to the realization that he is, in fact, the promised Messiah. So mission accomplished for Jesus, right? He'd be excited, right? You'd think so, except the next thing you read is this. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he's the Messiah. What? what? I mean, what's that all about? Well, actually, there's a reason for Jesus' response. There's a very good reason for it. And today, we're gonna to discover that reason. It will all make sense in a few moments, but it will only make sense after we first understand the context, the backstory, the big picture behind Jesus' words. And that is what this series is all about. It's a series dedicated to helping people to understand the story of the Bible, the meaning of Jesus' words, and the power of Jesus' life. 
by showing how everything fits together, by revealing the big picture. Now, in the first week of this series, we discovered God's original design for the world and all that God originally intended for humanity. We learned that God created a wonderful ordered universe with humans uniquely made in his image to live in harmony with him and with one another. In the second week of this series, we discovered how God's original purposes got sidelined by humanity's rebellion. And we learned to not confuse sin's decay with God's design. And we also learned in the second week, at the darkest moment in human history, when sin contaminated creation, God offered us a glimmer of hope by promising to send us a coming Redeemer. Now, last week, we continued to follow the biblical story by taking a 30,000-foot journey through the entire Old Testament portion of the Bible. We saw how God laid the groundwork for this promised Redeemer by creating the nation of Israel as God's delivery mechanism, a people through whom the scriptures, the prophets, and the Savior would come. Which brings us to today, to act four of this incredible drama. Today, we move from the Old Testament into the New Testament. We move from the old contract between God and his people to the new contract between God and his people. Now, physically turning the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament can be done in an instant. I mean, it's effortless, isn't it? Turning a page. However, when you turn from Malachi to Matthew, know that you are skipping over 400 years. Turning that page, I'm skipping 400 years of human history. There are 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and a lot of things took place during that time. During those 400 years, Alexander the Great marched off the map. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle were born, lived, and died. During those 400 years, many of the Jewish people migrated back into the land of Israel after having been scattered throughout the nations. During those 400 years, though, the people of Israel lived in the land, but they never actually ruled over the land. The Greeks were in charge for a while, then the Egyptians took over for a season. Then the Romans conquered the region, placing it and the Jewish people who lived there under Rome's tight control. Now, all that time, during those 400 years, God was essentially silent. His prophets stopped speaking while his people stood waiting. For 400 years, Israel waited and prayed, waited and watched, waited and hoped. They hoped that God would finally send the one he had promised to send. Remember, since the third chapter of the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, they had been waiting for the one who would come and crush the head of the enemy of their souls. For centuries, the prophets had been making predictions about his coming, dropping hints about his life and raising expectations about his power. Over the centuries, this anticipated figure had come to be known as the Messiah in the Hebrew language, and in the Greek language, this figure was referred to as the Christ. And now, as we turn the page from the Old to the New Testament, from Malachi to Matthew, the centuries-long wait is finally over. Because as we raise the curtain on Act 4 of the big picture, redemption is finally provided. Now, one of the more frustrating and at the same time exciting moments in life is when you order something from Amazon and then you track the package on your phone. Now, according to the app, your package has been shipped and it's even out for delivery. But they've been saying that all day. The hours have been passing, and your doorstep remains empty. So you keep checking the app, you keep checking your doorstep, and you keep asking yourself, how long is this delivery going to take? Perhaps, as you're listening to me today, you're feeling the very same thing. Except you're not waiting for a package to be delivered. You're waiting for a prayer to be answered. Did you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know the feeling have you been waiting on God for something? Is there some answer, some promise, some response from God that remains unfulfilled or incomplete in your life? If so, you are feeling a lot like the people of Israel were feeling 2,000 years ago. If that's you, know this. 
God can be trusted. God is faithful. God does all things well. However, as we're about to discover in today's teaching, and as the people of Israel discovered 2,000 years ago, God does not always do things the way we expect him to do things. But we can know that God does always do things the way that they should be done. So when we open our Bibles to the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, we discover how the first prophecy in the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, is finally fulfilled. Read with me from Matthew chapter 1. It says this, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now let's pause there for a second. That word pledged is, uh, in our concept, it might be engaged, but being pledged in the first century was engagement on steroids, really. When you were pledged to be married in the first century, you were legally married. To break a marriage pledge, you had to file a certificate of divorce. So Mary and Joseph are pledged to be married. They're engaged, they're legally contracted to be married, but they're not fully married yet. They're not yet having a, a sexual relationship. They're not yet living together. But scripture says Mary was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of God miraculously, the Holy Spirit supervened over a process where a, a fertilized egg miraculously appeared in the womb of Mary. So let's turn back to Matthew's description of events. Matthew writes, Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Let's pause there again. Joseph was a godly man. And up until that moment, he thought Mary was a godly woman. But now she's pregnant and he knows he's not the father. And Mary's trying to convince him that she has not had a sexual relationship with anyone else. She's trying to convince him that an angel of God appeared to her and informed her that she, a virgin, was going to miraculously give birth. Would you believe your fiancé if they told you a story like that? Well, Joseph didn't believe her. But neither did he want to humiliate her. So he decides to quietly dissolve their relationship. Let's keep reading. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek translation of the original Hebrew name Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. Matthew then goes on to give us further context to what took place. Matthew writes, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. So he's referring back to the Old Testament, where the prophet Isaiah said, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. They'll give him the title Emmanuel. Now, Matthew is giving us more of the big picture. Matthew is informing us that this is the one who had been promised long ago in the very first prophecy, in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. On the day that the enemy of our souls deceived that first human pair, enticing them to disobey God, unleashing the power of sin on the human experience, separating us all from God's design for our lives. On that day, way back then, speaking to the enemy of our souls, God made this promise in Genesis 3. I will put enmity, strife, between you, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. The mystery behind that strange concept of a woman's offspring is finally revealed. You see, the word offspring back in Genesis is literally the word for seed. It refers to the woman's seed crushing the head of the enemy. Now, that term seed throughout history always referred to the male. Yet God referred to the seed of the woman. What could that possibly even mean? It was a mystery for centuries. And now the mystery was solved. 
It meant the promised one, the Messiah, the Christ, would not be born in the usual way. And the words of other prophets were also more literal than anyone had ever imagined. This promised one, this Messiah, this Christ, would literally be God with us. This person, this promised one, would not just be some special prophet or even some angelic being. No, this promised one would literally be God taking upon himself the form of humanity. The New Testament writer named John, an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, described it this way. He wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So then, this promised Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, was more than met the eye. He was God, yet he was living as a human being, interacting with the rest of humanity. And why would God do such a thing? The prophets answered that question. God did this to save the people from their sins. But hold on to that thought for now. We're going to get back to it in a moment. Right now, let's try to get our minds around what the people were thinking 2,000 years ago, what the people were expecting 2,000 years ago, and the challenge that Jesus was facing 2,000 years ago. Remember, context is everything. Understanding the backstory is everything. Grasping the big picture is everything. That's why you and I better understanding the world that Jesus was born into will help us to better understand why Jesus did things the way he did them and why he said things the way he said them. 2,000 years ago, the messianic expectations in the nation of Israel had sort of morphed and drifted into them looking for a political savior. You see, they were thinking, God is going to send to us a king like David or Solomon, a king who's finally going to come and return Israel from our exile, from our being humiliated by other nations, and he's going to restore Israel. We're going to raise up an army. We're going to defeat our oppressors. We're going to rise up again, take over the land, rule again, and be a strong and mighty nation and rule the world. So over the centuries, Saving the people from their sins had come to mean saving the people from the sinful foreign oppressors and the sinful foreign rulers that had taken over the land. So imagine what would have happened if Jesus had stood up and proclaimed this to the masses. Hello, everyone. Your attention, please. My name's Jesus. I'm from the town of Nazareth, northern Galilee. I'm the one you've been waiting for all of these centuries. I am the promised Messiah. I'm the one who has come to rescue you and to deliver you. If Jesus had said that back then, the masses would have heard, folks, it's time for war. It's time for revolution. It's time to attack those dirty Romans, kill them all, take back control of our land. You see, back then, when they spoke about the kingdom of God, they were talking about a political kingdom with political power with national borders, with a massive army and a capital city in Jerusalem. But that's not at all what the kingdom of God is truly about. So if Jesus had stood up and publicly declared himself as the Messiah to the masses, if Jesus had let his followers proclaim to the masses that he was the Messiah, it would have brought down the full weight of Rome's military might on the land, crushing the people, confusing his message, and destroying his mission. So Jesus had to come at this from another angle. Jesus had to somehow demonstrate to everyone the true nature of the kingdom of God, how it was much larger, much more inclusive, much more powerful than they had ever dreamed. And on top of that, Jesus also had to reveal to them the true nature of his life, that he was a man, but not merely a man that he was God in the form of a man. So Jesus had an incredible challenge in front of him. He had to reveal to the masses the true nature of the kingdom of God, the true nature of the Messiah, and his true nature as God in human form, God with us. And the first four books of the New Testament, the first four biographies describing the life and the deeds of Jesus, commonly known as the Gospels, 
describe exactly how Jesus went about doing that very thing. Essentially, Jesus took the following approach. Privately, he chose a limited, select group of followers to whom he gradually imparted the full truth about his kingdom, his role, and his divine nature. So, for three years, Jesus spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week with his disciples. He's walking the streets with them. He's walking from the north to the south of the land, talking with them. He's teaching uh, in front of the crowds and then following up privately with them, explaining even more to them privately than he revealed to the crowds. He's performing miracles in front of the crowds and in front of the disciples. And he's slowly unveiling his true nature, his true role. He's teaching them. He's revealing truth to them gradually more and more and more as those three years unfold. Now, the closer Jesus got to the end of his life on earth, the more he unveiled to his followers and even to the world around him. One day, near the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus explained something to them that they were only able to fully grasp after his death and resurrection. The Gospel of Mark records Jesus' words. I'm quoting Mark now. He writes, They were on their way up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus and his followers. With Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. They're afraid because they're saying, Jesus, why are you heading into Jerusalem? That's where your enemies are. So they're wondering what he's doing. Let's go back to Mark. Again, he took the 12, those are the 12 closest uh, apostles. He took them aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. He said, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man, that's a title for himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. These are the Jewish religious leaders. And they will condemn him to death. And then they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles, that's the Romans, who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, that's whip him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Jesus told his followers what was about to happen. His followers heard his words, but they didn't understand his words. They had no idea what he was talking about. They likely figured he was telling them another parable. You see, their thinking was so locked into their preconceived notion of what the Messiah was supposed to do and how the future was supposed to unfold that they had no room in their minds for a Messiah that would die at the hands of the enemies. No, the Messiah defeats the enemies. Nonetheless, Jesus knew what he was doing. He does all things well. And he trusted the process. He knew what he had privately imparted to those men and women. He knew that it would later stand as the foundation upon which his church would be built. Now, that's what Jesus did privately with his chosen followers. Publicly, he took a more subtle approach. Publicly, his teaching was provocative and authoritative, and he let his miraculous deeds reveal the source of his authority. You see, Publicly, he did what only God could do, and then he allowed the masses to connect the dots over time. In smartphones, you know, there's facial recognition on your phone. There's software on your phone that all you have to do is look at your home screen and your phone opens up. That's a security device. Well, what your face is to your phone, Jesus' deeds were to God's power. Only your face has the ability to open your phone. Your face can do what no one else can do. In a similar way, Jesus was doing what only God could do. One day, near the end of his ministry, Jesus made some incredibly bold and provocative claims about himself. He's, he's revealing, revealing more about his messianic uh, truth. And so the religious leaders picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus asked them what they were so upset about. And they responded by saying, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. See, Jesus was revealing more about himself at the end. So Jesus said this to them. He said, don't believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Jesus essentially said, hey, I agree with you folks that anyone can claim to be God. But if I'm doing what only God can do, 
What does that tell you regarding the truthfulness of my claims? Well, Jesus' final conclusive statement and proof that his claims were true was his resurrection from the dead. Just as Jesus had predicted, they mocked him, they beat him, they hung him on a cross, and they killed him. And just as he predicted and promised, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he was no mere mortal, proving that his claims of divinity were true. And why did he do all of this? I mean, why was all of this necessary? Why did God go to all of this trouble of coming to earth in the form of a human, living in our midst, teaching the truth, demonstrating his power, dying, then rising from the dead? I mean, what was it all for? Well, he was later recognized as Emmanuel, literally God with us. His given name was Yeshua, which means the Lord God saves, because he came to save us from our sins. God came to save us from our sins. Are you seeing it connected? Are you seeing the big picture? That very first prophecy in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, set the scene for Jesus' life and for the rest of the Bible. Humanity was held captive under the power of sin and the power of the devil. That power is what separates every one of us from experiencing God's design and desire for our lives. We learned this way back in Act 1 of this series. We learned that we were uniquely created in God's image to have a loving relationship with God. We were created to experience and express the purest love imaginable. But that's not what we are fully experiencing. Why? Doesn't God love us? Doesn't God want to have a relationship with us? Yes, he does love us. Yes, he does want to have a relationship with us. Then what's the problem? Our sin is the problem. Our sin is what is separating us from fully experiencing God's love. Well, how? God is the source of that purest love. And God is holy. God is pure. Sadly, we are not holy. We are not pure. Our sin has polluted our hearts and poisoned our souls and separated us from God. Just like a healthy body cannot tolerate poison, a holy God cannot tolerate sin. And the power of sin is a power that no mere human can defeat. Every human is contaminated with sin, and no human has the ability to defeat sin or rise above sin. That's why we need a Savior, a Messiah, a Christ. That is why God took on human form. God came to do what no human could do. The most perhaps famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, puts it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, who trusts in him, will not perish, but will have eternal life. See, God came in the form of the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, and he took on human form, and he lived a perfect sinless life. And as he hung on that cross, he paid the wages of sin. He paid our moral debt. He was like a sponge for sin. He absorbed all the punishment, all the sin of the world upon himself, and he died paying the wages of sin. But he himself was sinless and perfect. So sin had no power or authority over him. So he rose from the dead, crushing, defeating the power of sin and death, and then offering us the gift of eternal life. That is what one biblical author was trying to communicate when he wrote, the wages that sin pays is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, in the Messiah, our Lord. And that brings us to today's big idea where we sum up the teaching in one simple phrase. Here it is. Our greatest problem is solved by God's greatest gift. Our greatest problem is solved by God's greatest gift. That's the context. That's the backstory. That's the big picture when it comes to the life of Jesus. He didn't just parachute into history out of nowhere. He had been promised and prophesied for centuries. Look around your life today. Look at the pain and the confusion that surrounds you and is maybe within you. It's all rooted, it's all sourced in the power of sin and the power of the evil one. And the bad news is this, 
There is nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do on your own to defeat that power. Absolutely nothing. That's why sin is your greatest problem. That's why sin is your biggest bully. Well, that's the bad news. But you didn't tune in today to hear bad news. So here's the good news. Your greatest problem is solved by God's greatest gift. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection destroyed the power of sin and death and the devil. Your greatest problem is solved by God's greatest gift. The only question that remains now is this. What are you doing with God's greatest gift? Have you accepted it? If you've not yet accepted it, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that in one minute. But what if you're watching and you have accepted this gift? What does that mean? I mean, does that mean that the story is over for you now? It's all done. It's wrapped up? Not at all. There's still much more to the story. This picture gets even bigger. But that's what we'll deal with next week when we continue with Act 5 of The Big Picture. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you saw our greatest problem. Our greatest problem was sin. Our sin separates us from you. It separates from your design. It separates us from your, your, your purpose for our lives. And there's nothing we could do to defeat the power of sin in our lives. We're contaminated with it. But you saw our greatest problem and you solved it with your greatest gift. You came in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. You lived a sinless life. You died in our place and you rose from the dead. Maybe you're watching today and you've not yet accepted this gift. Right now, I want to give you a chance to do that. Pray this prayer with me. Agree with me as though I'm saying words on your behalf. God, I acknowledge my greatest problem. It's sin. I acknowledge it. I admit it. And I ask you to come into my life and forgive me of my sin. I accept your gift of forgiveness in eternal life. Cleanse me from the inside out. Transform me from the inside out. And give me the courage to tell somebody about this decision that I've made today, even before my head hits the pillow this evening. By the authority of the resurrected Jesus, I pray this prayer. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, well done. Congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. The best advice I can give you is to tell somebody about this decision. Maybe a follower of Jesus who's been trying to tell you about Jesus. Or if you'd like, you can text the number on the screen right now and one of our pastoral staff will text you back. We're not going to phone you. We're not going to spam you. We're not going to uh, put you on a mailing list. We'll simply text you back and offer our services to you in any way that we can. Well, thank you for joining with us today for Act 4 of the Big Picture series. I hope you'll join us again next week for Act 5 of the Big Picture. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this week. If you have any prayer needs or requests, please text the number on the screen. Or if you're new to Broadway and you're looking to connect deeper, please scan the QR code on the screen and a pastor will reply and help you get connected to a place where you can best serve and grow. Here are the discussion questions you can use based on today's sermon. Pastor Darren unpacked the whole Old Testament in about 30 minutes. Is there a part of the Old Testament that you never understood or saw how it fit into the big picture? Why did you think it is so difficult for us to accept the fact that God does things differently than we'd like him to do? What do you think about Jesus's plan to reveal his true nature? Why do you think he did it this way? If you were to meet Jesus when he walked on earth, what would you expect him to be like? How does this compare to scripture's description of him? The Bible is very clear that there is nothing we can do to reconcile our brokenness. Why do we still try to do it on our own? We pray that by engaging deeper in today's message, it will help you along on your spiritual walk. Lastly, don't forget to check out broadwaychurch.com for all the things going on at the church and have a wonderful week.
thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Megan and I'm the Vancouver Campus Kids Pastor here at Broadway. We have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? That means the next step in your faith is to get baptized in water. If you've never made the decision to be baptized, we would love to invite you to take that next step this Easter Sunday. On March 31st, we will be having a special baptism service at all of our campuses, and we would love for you to be a part of it. You can apply to get baptized by clicking the baptism tab on the website. If you are a youth or young adult ages 15 to 25, we would love for you to join us on our annual Yukon missions trip. On this missions trip, we lead a camp just outside of Whitehorse and it is truly a life-changing experience. In fact, Broadway Church has been sending teams there for over 40 years. The deadline to sign up is March 31st, so make sure to sign up soon. All of the information is on the website. Risen Worship, the worship team of our Chinese ministry, will be hosting a worship concert on March 16th from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the City Reach Warehouse. This is a great opportunity to worship together and a time to get to know other people. Please join us and bring a friend. This event is free, but you have to register through our website or on the Chinese ministry Facebook page. City Reach is currently seeking a full-time program coordinator for our Food for Families program. This person would be responsible to manage the Vancouver site and provide the necessary leadership to our team that works together to feed 3,000 people each week. If this interests you, please check out the job description on the website. If you have kids between zero to grade eight, we have a fun opportunity coming up during spring break. Join us on March 19th and 21st between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for spring break family fun at the Vancouver campus. On March 19th, we'll have a bouncy obstacle course. And on March 21st, we will have not one, but two shows from our friends at Science World. Register online today. If you missed anything that I said, you can visit our website, broadwaychurch.com for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 